Welcome to the ITSP Magazine Podcast Network. You are about to listen to the Cybercognition Podcast, a show about artificial intelligence and how it is transforming the world around us, with your biological, sentient, and mostly rational human host, Hutch. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. Marco. Sean. Is your uh, cognition rolling? Or it's a little rusty. Is, like, is the coffee helping? The cogs are a little rusted. I need to. <laughs> I need. I, I just did some coffee to see if I could. Uh, I don't know. Is a coffee a solvent? I don't know. For for rust? A loosening, Brain solvent for loosening agent? Uh, yeah. <laughs> And I never try that. It, it, it certainly loses my uh, my brain quite a bit. So if I'm a little <laughs> hyperactive right now, that's that's why. But uh, <laughs> the 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 good news is that I don't need to be hyperactive. I don't need to entertain because Sean, we have uh, a host of one of our show that we had a pleasure to to that's talk right. before RSA conference not too long ago, and all of a sudden, boom. We have a yeah. podcast, a, a guest turn host, and uh, on on a topic that's on in the cogs everywhere. I think <laughs> it, it's it's the it's the things that I don't know if it's keeping the cogs moving or slowing them down. Well, I guess time will tell that. Uh, but uh, <laughs> Hutch is with us. Hutch, thanks for uh, thanks for being on. Hey, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, this is super cool, and uh, we're, we're thrilled to have your show, Cyber Cognition, on as part of the uh, the, the podcast network. And um, yeah, I think the the stars aligned. I know you come from the uh, from the, the world of space as well, so the stars aligned. I'll say uh, for you to talk to an audience about AI and uh, and all that all that comes with it. So. Before we get into it, though, I mean, we're gonna we're gonna talk about your show, of course. That's kind of the, the whole purpose of this to kind of give folks a, a taste for for what's coming. Um, but I think it's important for them to know who Hutch is. So maybe I think start back with some of the the, the early days, maybe even before some of the the space stuff you did. How how did you get into technology and and what what uh, what kind of brought you to this point where where AI is such a such an important topic for you. So I was actually originally, when I got out of high school, I went in to uh, school at University of Houston in Texas and was majoring in philosophy. And uh, one of my favorite classes while I was in there was symbolic logic. And I remember uh, at the time I was putting myself through school, actually working as an overnight customer service manager at Walmart. And Uh, There was a guy that frequently came in as a customer overnight, and uh, it was one of those people that has uh, ultimately ends up having a significant impact on your total life trajectory, but you don't realize it at the time. Uh, But he came in one day and he he saw my symbolic logic book that I was working through, and uh, he had a technology background himself, and he started, he asked me to explain some of the stuff that I was doing, and uh, a lot of it was kind of the same things if then disjunctions, conjunction logic, stuff like that. And uh, honestly, I don't even remember what language he was working out of, but he kind of took the exact problem that I was working with. And he's like, you're, you're essentially doing coding. And on paper writes out, I think it was JavaScript, uh, just writes out more or less the, the coding equivalent of what I was doing. So I had always had kind of an interest in technology, but that was really uh, what kind of made me take the deep dive and and start playing around with it a lot more. Um, I ultimately ended up making a move to a a company that was, it it was a a help desk job for a a triple play company that did the the television, uh, internet and uh, home phone service over. It was one of the first ones fiber optic to the home. Uh, So very early on before it's time, we had all kinds of problems. The, The technology wasn't ready. We, nobody knew how to handle fiber. We had people that closed the cabinets on the fiber and broke all the connections. Uh, so the company ended up going under and I was without a job along with close to a hundred people that worked at the company with me who were all looking for more or less the same jobs in the area. So without any kind of academic credentials, uh, I, 
kind of scrambled to find anything and ultimately ended up joining the Air Force uh, and ended up being a, a fantastic opportunity for me. I got uh, access to technology that I otherwise would have never been able to play around with. Um, Cause unlike many of the other military branches in the Air Force, you actually get good technology and not hand-me-downs. Um, not a knock on anybody else, just the, <laughs> the, the horror stories that I've heard from some of my friends in the other branches. Um, so uh, the rest is history. Um, got, I, I did a lot of work in the, the cybersecurity field and also uh, a lot of interest in, uh, personally, a lot of interest in social psychology, philosophy, obviously, given my background and what I was originally looking at, and uh, also artificial intelligence. So for the artificial intelligence side, I started playing around with it probably about a decade ago uh, with trying to master the markets and uh, make myself rich through day trading. Um, and uh, so it did all kinds of different models with scikit-learn, uh, Python, um, from there, started also playing around with language models and uh, testing some different security threats and risks around those, uh, and, and had been doing that for a long time. Actually, was working with some of the early GPT models before ChatGPT came out. So uh, I feel like in that regard, I got a, a good head start on what now everybody is paying attention to. Um, and now that it is becoming once again such a hot topic, uh, I thought it would be a great opportunity to uh, take what is otherwise a passion and interest of mine and build out this podcast and, and really start addressing for me what is some of the major issues related to uh, society and the social and cultural impacts involved with the integration of artificial intelligence into our daily lives. No, no lack of uh, conversations to have there for sure. <laughs> No, that that's for me. It's just like kicking the door open for me to start talking <laughs> for hours about this. But uh, uh, that's why I'm going to leave you go first, Sean. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, I, I I almost wanted to ask the question, given your background. Uh, I mean, when when we talk about technology, we and certainly in the cybersecurity world, we talk about weakness and vulnerabilities and the the uh, opportunity to exploit those for gains in a number of different ways, a lot of which are technology oriented, but some do cross over into the physical world and, and the greater societal impact. Um, but do we, and so it's easy, certainly from coming from this field, it's easy for me to make that, that view of vulnerability to exploit. Do humans have the same... <laughs> weaknesses in in their intelligence and yet we don't talk about them that way so i'm, I'm kind of wondering for people who can kind of see my hands on the screen the, the the weakness in intelligence human versus machine or artificial and and maybe even the ability to to exploit it are they on the same level or different uh, I think there are a lot of parallels. Uh, there's also a lot of differences too, but I, I think some of the parallels that definitely stand out for me with artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, no matter how you try to tailor that data to avoid it, there are inevitably going to be biases associated with that. And, and I think that is absolutely true of human cognition as well. We are naturally inclined to make judgments based on a, a finite number of experiences that we've had in our life. And those experiences inevitably lead to uh, biased decision making. And so I, I think in that regard, we have a, a vulnerability that's comparable to what you see in artificial intelligence. Uh, I think for for some of the earlier artificial intelligence models, uh, stuff like uh, vanishing gradients also uh, could probably be compared in, in some regards to forgetful memory or something that uh, was once relevant in your and present in your memory. That uh, and Vanishing gradients, of course, is is really uh, one of the or gradients themselves is one of the big factors that's involved in uh, weighting the different connections within neural network systems. And uh, one of the problems that you have, especially when you're going through uh, recurrent analysis of multiple different layers, is that those gradients themselves can increasingly become or exceptionally large in the the form of exploding gradients or 
exceedingly small in the form of vanishing gradients uh, to where certain factors that previously would have and potentially should uh, be considered in a conclusion uh, will almost become trivial or completely irrelevant because of the fact that those gradient values just kind of build on top of each other through a multiplication process. So uh, I, I think in that way, you've also got something that is comparable to kind of uh, loss of memory over time, or even in the same regard, if you look at exploding gradients, um, kind of hyper fixation on certain things, um, or, or even analogous to like human paranoia, I guess. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think there are definitely a lot of parallels. Um, I, I, I think there are other ways that uh, we see significant differences and deviations between human cognition and machines. Um, obviously, one of them being that machines are, are extremely uh, analytical. And, and while I think that that is true of humans as well, I, I don't think that we are or ever will be capable of doing it on the same scale that systems are. Whereas uh, machines have or humans have other vulnerabilities that are more related to our emotional temperaments and our, um, I, I guess, really, for, for lack of a better word, our sentience that currently does not exist. And, and I, I don't expect based on any of the current models that we're building will exist any time in the near future for artificial intelligence. All right. I'm kind of my, my <laughs> clog, my, my, my brain is uh, less rusted now and it's going a million miles the, the an hour because kicking in. <laughs> not, no, cause I mean, this is the stuff I, I think all day long and Sean knows it. I, yeah. I, I think in terms of sociology, philosophy and how it applies in all of this. And, and uh, we, we, we just started using an artificial intelligence on on uh, ITSP magazine. It's it's a soft launch. It's a uh, based on Chat uh, GPT four, and it's about the all the content that we have. And so it's going to suggest if we talk about something, uh, what our guest and host. And uh, I was writing. I created this. We created this character, and and I wanted to explain that artificial intelligence really is it's. It's what knows and how it learns something. I don't know if it makes sense to you. So my point is, it's only that because we fed that kind of information. We put some kind of emotions in there, or, but, but it's not the human emotion. So as you're talking of all of this, I, I guess a, a book that came in my mind was Blink. I don't know if you've ever read Blink, but it's kind of like how... Um, it's um, uh, it, it's famous um, sociologist that wrote it, uh, Mac. Uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, but it's about you have the perception of something, and then you apply logic. And often your first perception, that blink of an eye, of maybe a, an antique expert knows if something is false or fake. Or, or a true piece of art, they kind of, you know it before you actually start applying all the logic to see if it's... Just based uh, on their unique experience. And yeah, it's something that you just can't explain. And so... Oh, let's see, it's the trained gut, right? With intuition, right? <laughs> right. Intuition. Well, we call it intuition, but it's also our own experience, something that kicks in. And, and when you apply that to a machine, I just went very large on this to say... Like you said, I don't think that we can ever replicate this intuition in a machine. So it's up to us to create the machine that we want it to, to have. Absolutely. So, yeah, I, I, I think there, it, it, don't get me wrong, the, the latest generation of artificial intelligence capabilities with transformer architecture are incredible pieces of technology. But but they really are just statistical engines that are based on, like you said, right based on probability, the, right? Tuning of it and and nothing more than that. And I think and that's actually what my first episode, <laughs> that, that's real actually what my first episode is really about is yeah. uh, people's tendency. I was going there. <laughs> oh, fair enough. I'll, I'll let you tell me about it. that. No, no, <laughs> tell me about it. Your first okay, episode. I'll uh, so the first episode is uh, the Eliza effect, and it is focused on just that. Which uh, so in. Uh, the 1960s, a researcher named Weizenbaum created a what is the first documented chatbot called Elisa. And even then, when people would interact with it, even though the system was 
extremely simplistic compared to what our technology is capable of today. But even then, people would have a tendency to feel like they are interacting with something that is more than just a mechanical system, a rule-based system. And so uh, what the episode really looks at is uh, kind of the history behind the ELISA effect, what it is, but also what it means for us in the modern world. Because while it was a factor then, back in the 60s, when you introduce the technology that we have today, which really even our modern systems are still rule-based systems, we don't write the rules anymore. We write the systems that themselves write the rules based on the training data that we provide. But there's still, ultimately, there is a, a mathematical necessity involved in the way that the output is uh, results from the input that is provided and the, the configurations of the system itself. So unfortunately, because of the complexity of these systems and how impressive they are at mimicking and replicating that sense of intelligence and, and even sense of emotion and sense of um, kind of factors that we think of as being uniquely human, because of their capability in doing those things, our tendency to fall for the ELISA effect is dramatically more than it was then. And, and you're seeing even uh, extremely intelligent, well-educated people that are starting to speak about these systems as if they are conscious. And, and I think another thing that we're seeing is we're seeing uh, a problem with just our day-to-day -day rhetoric, where we talk about, we use loaded terms like uh, knows or thinks when referring to these machines, when they don't know anything, they don't think anything, they are mm -hmm. programmatically generating output based on input that's providing in there. And so uh, I think there's that tendency to speak about these language systems in that way even further exacerbates that problem that we have of wanting to anthropomorphize these systems, of wanting to assume that there's more under the hood than there actually is. We, we want that. That's, that's what it's really driving this. We, I mean, I was reading an article about some uh, researcher at Microsoft that they say, well, you know, I think it's really becoming sentient. And some other people were like, well, that's what you want it to be. You know, it's kind of like when you we see faces everywhere, right? Some, some people throat. may want it. Personally, I think the idea is, is somewhat I mean, terrible. I think it's human to, to, to have this creator uh, you know, approach to thing, replicate who we are and, and how other object thinks and, and so forth. Anyway, a quick note before I pass to Sean is that the book I was talking about was Blink, The Power of Thinking Without Thinking, uh, Malcolm uh, uh, Gladwell. That's uh, oh, that's the book. So I'll very famous have. author. Just I blanked on that. I blinked and blanked on it. That's how it goes. <laughs> so, um, you weren't, Sean, you weren't trained to remember that piece of information. Had, that had, that 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 what makes me human. I just I could record the remember the concept, but I couldn't remember the the, the factual data about That's that. Right. Well, be, because this is such a broad topic. I mean, I started with kind of this my background. I kind of started with the cyber realm of things. Marco went into uh, uh, how human like it might be, could be, will be, won't be, shouldn't be, <laughs> right? Um, that, and those are just two, two shards on a gigantic iceberg. I don't even know if those are those are probably above, above the water shards that we can see and think about, and probably a huge amount below that. So, talk to me about kind of the the scope of your show. Um, what what do you if you can kind of contain it <laughs> and tell, give people an idea of where you'll go, how you might weave through some things, what you hope people will get. Uh, get from it uh, by by listening to you and and guests uh, for some episodes if when you choose to have them on. So the intent of the show is is partly to keep people aware of the ongoing trends associated with machine learning and artificial intelligence and how we are seeing those integrated into new capabilities and and that itself is something that is moving tremendously fast, unlike anything that we've seen before. So. There's, there's that component of it, but really the, the part that uh, I'm most passionate about and the part that I think is going to show through in many of the episodes that I have and really even in some of the guests that I have in mind that we will have on the show uh, in the future is speaking to the cultural and social impacts related to artificial intelligence, uh, because I, I think those are 
were already significant. If you look at even the older firms of artificial intelligence, where we uh, have integrated uh, machine learning capabilities into the way that we've done targeted advertising and the way that we have uh, created systems that are uh, constantly giving you those instant gratification dopamine hits as you scroll through and your delivered content that's uniquely tailored to what appeals to you. Um, so I, I think we've already seen significant social and cultural impacts related to artificial intelligence. And I think in this next evolution of newer emerging artificial intelligence and generative AI, uh, I, I think we're really just at the next stage of that. We're seeing uh, an even further push for instant gratification, for having knowledge directly at our fingertips at the very moment that we want it to be able to uh, instantly create things in our mind just with our words uh, and, and have it instantly manifest in front of us. So I, I think that in that regard, and also in kind of the just the psychological impact related to uh, having so much more additional capabilities that uh, absent of that technology, we would not have. Uh, I think we're going to continue to see significant impacts, uh, some good, some bad related to uh, people's lives, mental health, um, and, and the way they interact with others within society. I want to get I want to get your thanks for that, by the way, because I want to get your thoughts on this, because as you're as you're describing um, what you're going to talk about and how, how you're going to kind of talk about it, I'm thinking that we've probably already been living with a lot of AI and didn't know it. For example, I'm sure I, I talk with a big a big uh, distributor who, who sells stuff uh, through through Prime. <laughs> Right, for example, and I, I'm certain that half the time, if not all the time, I'm not actually chatting with a person when I'm when I'm on there. Yeah, Sean, you're you're absolutely right. Uh, artificial right. intelligence is already everywhere. Yeah. Um, so so it's been normalized, but probably and only because I'm in the space that I that I probably re realize that that's happening, right? So it, I guess the, have we switched over with? GPT-4 and an interface that everybody can now access and APIs that drive a bunch of new systems where it's raised raised awareness again so that it's surfaced that this is being used. And are we going to reach another point where it's normalized and it kind of goes away? I, I think there's a couple things that make this generation of artificial intelligence uniquely different. Uh, one is that I think the approachability of it has democratized artificial intelligence. And, and what I mean by that is that artificial intelligence for decades now has been accessible. There's been open source libraries. There's been capabilities where anybody can play with it. But the bar was much higher because it required uh, a certain amount of technical skill set in order to be able to use that artificial intelligence effectively. With the latest generation of machine learning, specifically with using transformer architecture to uh, build models where the interface is normal human language, it has made systems to where they are usable without any kind of technical background, any kind of expertise, if you can speak human language, and not even just English, because we're starting to see more and more of these models and languages all around the world. If you can speak human language, then you can interface with these systems and, and you can use them very effectively. So I, I think that's one reason why uh, this is significantly different than the previous AI that, like you said, is everywhere, but it's under the hood and it's operating behind the scenes based on the the, the choices of a, a few handful of technical companies. Um, the other reason why I think that this is uniquely different is that we are starting to see a, a consolidation of artificial intelligence uh, capabilities. And, and what I mean by that is rather than in, in the past, we used different types of AI for different capabilities, Conver or convolutional neural networks were used for computer vision purposes, uh, recurrent neural networks and long short-term memory architecture was used for, for language models. Um, different classification and regression algorithms were used for, for mathematical analysis. Well, with transformers and the type of architecture that ChatGPT and GPT-4 are based off of, it is a multimodal 
type of artificial intelligence. So basically anything that you can encode into data, not just text, not just words, uh, but audio or uh, pieces of a picture in order to create visual capabilities. Uh, we can now use the same type of artificial intelligence for all of these different capabilities. And so rather than having to focus on acceleration and advances in a bunch of different disciplines of artificial intelligence, any new groundbreaking capabilities or advances in the area of transformer architecture, machine learning, and artificial intelligence is going to contribute to AI in every single one of these disciplines. So you also have this accelerator where uh, it's not just kind of a, a variety of different areas that we're having to increase our capabilities in, but uh, we've got the kind of the traditional exponential growth technology accelerator on top of the fact that everything is now consolidating and uh, advances in one area mean really advances in all areas. Wow. So, oh. you know, what I was thinking is, uh, remember the fifth element, the Luc Besson movie where the fifth element digests an entire amount of culture and learn the language in a few minutes watching TV. And, and that makes me think like how before we used to refer to the library of Alexandria where all the knowledge was and then the TV and radio. And now there is the internet. Like you just plug into the internet and everything comes together. And I think it's hard for people not to think of this as a, creating something so powerful because it has the, all the knowledge of the world. But then can this something so powerful act on it? Is it a Jarvis that goes crazy? Is that some of this sci-fi scenario? So I think it's natural for, for humans looking at this and be like, holy shit, <laughs> this yeah. is scary, right? So what what is your feeling about this with your background in philosophy and the, your approach with this podcast? I mean, where are you trying to go with this? Are you trying to say, yeah, we need to push pause? Or are you going to be more of, let's welcome it? I don't know. I would, so that that's a tough question because I have. Yeah. I realistically, I would, I would like to say that if it was feasible to push pause, I would be all for it. The mm. problem is I don't think that it's a realistic solution because if we push pause, that doesn't mean that everybody's pushing pause. It's nearly impossible to get everybody on the same page as, uh, as that is concerned. Uh, I think, uh, unfortunately the, uh, the cat is out of the bag. Um, Pandora's <laughs> box is open, so to speak. There's, there's no going back. And so uh, for me, I, I think uh, a couple things come out of that. One, I would like to see more openness in the industry because I, I think that there, we're, we're no longer in a situation where we're well past a situation where nobody's going to have access to this technology. Somebody's going to have access to this technology. And then it becomes a question of, is that uh, remain in the hands of a few extremely powerful tech companies or governments, or is it more democratized? And uh, I think probably the lesser of two evils, which I think both are concerning and have risks. But for me, the lesser of two evils is for it to be in the hands of the masses uh, so that there's high visibility on it. And so that uh, I think in that regard, there will be uh, more attention given to making sure that actions are taken to mitigate those risks overall. Um, I, I, I think I, I'm optimistically cautious is I think the best way to very briefly describe my opinions on artificial intelligence. Uh, I think there's a tremendous amount of risk. And I do think that that is something that I intend to highlight with a lot of the episodes that we have uh, is some of my concerns, both for the, the immediate present. And then also um, I, I think a, a lot of the episodes are going to look in kind of that, that futurist perspective of speculating based on current trends, what does lie in the future for artificial intelligence and machine learning. And so I think in that regard, it, it likely will appeal to people who um, like science fiction and, and like the idea of just imagining what the future may hold, because I think there's no question that it's going to be drastically different than what it is today. Um, and, and I think we just have to take our understanding of what's happening now and the way that things are moving. And, and I, I think it's not only entertaining to speculate about what may be the case in the future, but I think it's also uh, prudent and kind of well-advised to consider those risks and, and start having dialogues about those in advance. Yeah. 
and I, uh, having been playing with it for a while, I'm, I'm excited for what's possible. And, uh, but also very afraid of the, the areas that you said one might have a little less impact than other, but I'm afraid of, of it in the hands of, of the general public. I'm afraid of it in the hands of big corporations. I'm afraid of it in the hands of, of government for sure, for different reasons. Um, cause the common thread or through all three of those is people, yeah. <laughs> right. And, and not everybody has the same intentions. And, well, I think, I think if, if nothing else, so there was, there was a project recently called chaos GPT, where somebody took uh, basically a service connected version of chat GPT that is able to take actions autonomously. And they basically gave it the directive of destroy the world. Um, right now, there's not enough service connections and plugins for ChatGPT to successfully comp or accomplish that objective. But I think it tells you something about human nature that right. somebody out there was just like, let's try and see what happens. Let's see where this um, goes. Yeah. So I, 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 I think they're, they're, you're right. People is the, uh, the big concern in every single yeah. one of the possible options. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. It, could, it could just be as simple as some kid. How many kids can I bully with one, <laughs> with yeah. one transformer? <laughs> Uh, well, do do you want to play a game of thermonuclear war? You know, like <laughs> I mean, somebody's going to do it, and and I I want to wrap this conversation because um, I think your connection between philosophy and and, and AI and technology, as well as some of our other uh, you know new um, new show actually on 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 the program, and I am loving having this conversation myself and i and i look at this fact that years ago you would talk about if you were studying philosophy you were as far as possible on <laughs> on the line of left to right or a to z from technology right. i mean it was either philosophy or as a or, or math right or technology and now the, the extreme are going on a circle with touch. And I feel like we talk so much about ethics and philosophy. And in a way, it's a way to know ourselves. Like as we try to understand artificial intelligence, the truth is we are really trying to understand how are we going to use these tools? How, what is that knowledge that we're going to put in the machine? And what is the capability that we're going to put? Which ultimately comes down to are we going to play uh, thermonuclear war or are we going to play let's fix the environment and <laughs> and all the diseases and so forth? And yeah. from somebody like you that is going to touch on all of this with a philosoph philosophical approach, I cannot wait to honestly listen <laughs> to all the conversation that you're going to bring yeah. on the on the table. It's a conversation I'd love to have, but I'm not able. So I'm glad you are. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just listen to it. So, so exactly. can you can you have uh, can you outline maybe some of the topics that you you're thinking to 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 bring on in the the next episode? Uh, so the immediate next episode that I'm I'm looking at is going to talk about our. Uh, increasing reliance on technology and artificial intelligence, how, how we're seeing that progress uh, as new technology is rolled out. Um, it's actually going to draw a parallel between artificial intelligence and the 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 Borg, the collective from uh, Star Trek, mm. and really the, the whole idea of resistance is futile, you have to assimilate. And, and I think that we are seeing that both in our per personal and professional lives. If we yep. don't adapt if we don't integrate these capabilities and these skill sets uh, into our own lives, then we fall behind. We get left behind. We're not able to compete. Businesses are not able to compete. Personally, we're not able to compete in the job market. And I think that there are, when, when you follow that trend to its logical conclusion of where that ends up, I, I think that is setting a, a somewhat of a dangerous precedent that as technology increases, we're going to see a, a situation where we're increasingly losing our own humanity and something about our own level of cognition by that increased reliance on technology. So uh, really excited on pulling that episode together. And uh, I've uh, got a whole list of other ideas that are not on the top of mind. So, uh, but there, there's definitely more to come and I'm, I'm excited. Ask Chad GTP. There you go. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, already, nothing already else did. it's a great idea generator <laughs> <laughs> exactly That's right. 
Well, very exciting. I'm happy that we took the time to have yeah. this conversation. It was fascinating, the first one that we had. And I'm so glad that I really love when a guest turn into a, a host because you know, it means that it clicked. It means that it was already up in the air for something to, to happen. And this is a topic that, again, like Sean said, we know quite a bit about it, but it sounds to me that you, you definitely know way, way, way more than <laughs> us. So I am looking forward to listen to all your, um, your, your episode. And once in a while, I think I'm just going to knock on your door and say, hey, why don't you come on my show and talk about it? Absolutely. <laughs> Meantime, I have questions. <laughs> I, I have questions. Help me to answer those. <laughs> but yeah. in the in the meantime, I want to, of course, invite everybody to listen to the first episode, which is fascinating already, a strong connection between psychology and, and technology. And uh, it, it's out there, uh, your own show. It's available on uh, uh, Spotify, Apple, uh, Google Podcast, and uh, everywhere you listen to your show. And so... For everybody, subscribe. There'll be links, of course, here, and it's easy to find on on ITSP Magazine. So, Sean, I'll leave you the honor to to wrap these and yeah. push the end recording button when you're ready. Well, I want to thank you, Hutch, for uh, for joining us and for bringing this conversation, and for taking the time today to uh, give us some insight and, and where you're planning to take things, so the audience can uh, can learn more and, and follow you. Cybercognition podcast by Hutch. And uh, your profile there, I'm sure folks can reach out to you. If, you, if anybody's like Marco and I, they're going to have questions too. So <laughs> may, I, I presume your show will be one that uh, sparks a lot of engagement. <laughs> Why did you think that way? Or what about this? Or, and uh, they're not getting the answers they want from Chat GPT. So we'll yeah. send them all to Hutch. You can answer them all. <laughs> Always excited to have a conversation. Yeah. Love it. All right. all right. Well, thanks everybody for listening and uh, watching uh, this episode. And uh, stay tuned for more from Hutch and uh, more from us and the rest of the uh, family here on the SB Bank Podcast Network. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Cybercognition Podcast with Hutch, part of the ITSP Magazine Podcast Network. If you learned something new and this conversation made you think, then add this show to your favorite podcast player. Subscribe to the ITSP Magazine YouTube channel and share the ITSP Magazine Podcast Network with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company, and wish to connect your brand to our conversations and our audience, visit itspmagazine.com to learn how to sponsor one or more of our podcast channels. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey.